I am Mike Houston, and uh, I am uh, an actor, uh, a producer, and director. And I, I always love asking this first: which came first for you? What What was the uh, you know the first love in the arts industry? Uh, acting, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was de- that was definitely what got me into it. I, I remember, I mean, I've been doing it since I was a kid, and like it's just something I've always just I love just being a ham and jumping into stuff and pretending. And uh, I remember when I was in kindergarten, um, we did the play, we did Little Red Riding Hood, and I was the wolf. And um, you know, at that age, you kind of you have a select memory at four or five. You know, you don't remember everything, but. Some things are so vivid and that one, that one, I can almost pinpoint exactly what I was wearing. Uh, so I was like, okay, I think, I think that's when I knew, wow, this is, this is a good time. I love doing this. So <laughs> I'd say acting. And then, and then once I got into it professionally and uh, I started a production company with some friends and then I went into directing and producing. So. Oh, that's, that's awesome. And I have to go back to this. Do you have a fairly eidetic memory to you know growing up and i mean i think so yeah all that yeah yeah i'm actually a little surprised sometimes at what memories come up and how how clear they are um now it's interesting right because it's always in the mind's eye so i can see what it looks like from the mind's eye which is kind of strange um but there are definitely moments where i kind of remember exactly like what i was looking at too it's kind of cool yeah, I love the uh, like the sense memory rushes you can get sometimes too. If you smell something, mm. you're like, "Oh, there's a memory I completely forgot about." Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> well, I do want to go back to you know you growing up and you had that experience. At that point, were you, you know, absorbing cinema or TV or theater? I mean, where was your mind at when it came to performance? And you know, oh, there's <laughs> people on a screen that do things. I didn't know they were real. You know, like what what was yeah. that like for you? You know, it's interesting. I never really thought about like what movie. This is actually great, uh, kind of hilarious. Like I will say, the movie that I remember the most of saying, like, "Oh, you can do, you can do this for a career. Like, you can make money doing this." Was um, Aladdin. And although it was, you know, it was a, an animated uh, feature, and so it was all voice acting. Um, I also, at the time, you know, when I was growing up, and um, I started singing uh kind of young and and i just love doing that and so i got into musical theater uh in middle school and high school and i just remember going to see the movie aladdin and i i remember walking out of the theater and i was like with my dad and i'm like um that's what i want to do like that that's amazing like if i can do stuff like that and get paid rock and roll uh a little longer journey than i was expecting but <laughs> i did it <laughs> <laughs> it's the longest uh like stage one in a career that I could ever imagine for anybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I came to it a little late too, because <laughs> I told my dad that, and you know, my father, who's an awesome human being, uh, very supportive of my career now, you know, he's kind of old school, uh, you know, from Alabama, uh, was in the air force. And so for him, the idea of a career, it just didn't make a lot of sense to him that the arts could provide that. Uh, or maybe provide as much as he was hoping so I wouldn't have to, you know, live with him forever. Um, and so he, you know, he kind of, he pushed me in a different direction in college to help me, you know, just to make sure that I was going to be okay. And then, um, man, I didn't, I didn't actually start working professionally until I was 30, 29, 30 years old. Really? Uh, I mean, does yeah. that include, you know, union projects or just, just literally anything? Uh, no, that's, yeah, I mean, non-union, union, I would say 2000, 2003, 2004, I was in Boston, and I had been there working for a company. I was I was working for an internet company at the time. Um, I lost that job, and I just kind of was in the sea, because I had gone out there with, with, uh, with, with the plans of... Um, uh, long-term relationship with a young woman and, and it didn't work out. Yeah. Same old story. Yep. <laughs> um, and then, uh, as that kind of went that direction and then I was like, what am I doing out here? I don't even know what I'm, what I, what my purpose is. And I started working in a restaurant and, um, I'd always, like I said, acting has always been something I enjoyed, uh, to kind of touch back on that earlier question about like, 
cinnamon stuff. By that time, I was definitely watching, you know, a lot of films. Um, you know, kind of the run of the mill stuff, though. You know, whatever was popular at the time, I wouldn't, and I definitely took in. Um, but there was just something about like this idea that I didn't really have anything to do now. And I thought, okay. And then my mom, who was just incredible, when I the day I got let go from my job, uh, I told her what was going on. It was the first time I'd ever been let go from a job. And uh, she said, you know, I think you should think about trying acting. You know, she's like, you love doing it. You have time. And I was like, well, that's just the best thing you could have said today on what could have been a really terrible day. Um, and that that kind of kicked me in the bum a little bit. And uh, after some time working in the restaurant, just trying to save up some money um, and just kind of exploring what it was like to do that in Boston. I got into some community theaters and uh, started getting some roles. And one thing led to another to then like this paid Shakespeare program I got to do. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. I'm getting paid. And and I got into the world of commercials there in Boston too. And it just, it just was how I was just having a lot of fun doing it. And I, you know, I was pretty ambitious. I just thought, well, if I can do it here, maybe I can do it in a bigger place, you know, <laughs> New York, New York, baby, you know? Well, that's, I don't know, man, that, that is the most heartwarming, uh, comment by a parent we've ever had on this podcast when it comes to pursuing you know usually it's you know, a bunch go work at the post office I man what, what are yeah. you complaining about you can go get a job but the fact that your mom said you should go out and and try it and uh, in all honesty you know having worked in the service industry myself it, it is grueling and those late hours can really hit but you know i can only imagine you were just really invigorated whenever you had an audition or you know you were going to do some community oh theater yeah and, that catharsis yeah, yeah. was just there. hundred percent. And and you nailed it because like, you know, community theater, you don't get paid. Um, and it's in the, it's in the evening times. And so um, it was a lot of fun to get to know people who also, who did have, you know, full-time day jobs. We had one guy, I remember doing um, company and I'd like to say one thing, Boston has a community theater scene and a musical theater scene that is quite incredible. Like the shows that a lot of the companies were, were taking on there for community theater. I was so like shocked because I was sort of familiar with Sondheim at the time. Again, still just kind of get my toes in there. And once I really started paying attention to who he was and his music and, and how difficult this stuff is, I just couldn't believe that we were taking on uh, this show. And uh, I will say, uh, the young lady, Katie Pickett, I played um, the character Paul and she played Amy. And I don't know if you're familiar with company, but there's this really amazing song uh, that Amy sings uh, about our wedding day. And it goes about a mile a minute. It's one of the fastest time signatures I've ever seen on a song. And Katie crushed it. I just want to say that Katie Pickett crushed it. Um, and I was just super impressed with how talented people were that weren't doing acting for any more than the hobby that it was and the love that they had for it. Um, and like, yeah, like there was a guy in that show who's a doctor during the day. He just, we'd come in at night and, and bang out some uh, Sondheim, you know, it was, <laughs> it was really, really cool. And then, you know, but then you meet a couple of people who are kind of putting their, their toe in the ring and, and wanting to get started on something. And they, they would, you know, the networking, like, hey, you should go do this. You should try this. And to your point, it, I was so excited just to even think about being artistic and trying it as a as a job. And so, yeah, anytime they would say, you should check this out. The next day I was on the phone or I was on the train going to wherever I was going to say like, hey, I was told I should come and meet you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like true entertainment business networking. You should go talk to this person. Okay. All right. Fine. I'll go check it yeah, out. Yeah, we'll done. All right. I learned it a couple times like oh you can't just walk up to the door and knock oh i'm sorry I, there's an appointment okay got it. copy <laughs> <laughs> you guys should put a sign above the buzzer next to the door because it blends in with the the framing i don't i can't i didn't see it I, i'm sorry i couldn't yeah <laughs> yeah how in the heck am i really supposed to understand that situation <laughs> next time so i mean man how how long was it i mean if you were looking in general because obviously it was a catharsis for you right as you were you know working in the service industry and 
then honing your craft and really, you know, diving back into performing arts. Mm -hmm. How long was it before you gained any representation? I always think that's a really interesting story to hear, especially outside (laughs) of Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, it's an interesting story. Um, So when I made the decision to move from Boston to New York, um, I got here and started working in the same thing in a restaurant and I didn't know anybody. I knew one person. There was one person in New York city that I knew uh, who happens to be my best friend since four years old uh, in Colorado, uh, Heidi Kippenhan. And she was in New York at the time. And I said, Hey, listen, I'm moving to New York. Do you know anybody looking for a roommate? And she said, Hey, well, that's crazy. We just happen to have somebody move out of ours. We need a roommate. So it was really fortunate that I got to live with someone that I knew especially someone like, you know, the closest person in my life. <laughs> um, and then from there, just asking questions, like not ha- like kind of adrift at sea at first, like, what am I-, I don't even know where to start. And then I got some advice from a headshot photographer about an acting studio uh, called the William Esper studio. And said, he said, you know, this is kind of, and at the time it was, it was pretty, it was still pretty small. And he's like, it's kind of underground. But uh, most people that I shoot that go there, they just rave about it. So I went and interviewed, and, and I was very fortunate to be, you know, asked to, to participate. Um, so in my first year of class, uh, not long after we started in the fall, I get an email from the Screen Actors Guild of Boston, okay? Because, and this is even crazier, on the bus ride from Boston to New York, uh, like the day before I was moving all of my stuff or two days before I was moving all of this, I wanted to come and make sure everything was set. I had auditioned for a film in Boston that was going to shoot in Boston. It was going to be a local hire job. And, you know, I hadn't heard anything, whatever. But on the bus down to New York, I get a call and they say, hey, uh, you've been cast in this movie. And I said, wait, does that mean like like a principal role and they said yeah yeah and i said does that does that mean that i qualify for my sag card and she said yeah i think so and so of course i i immediately get on the phone with sag and i'm like hey uh so i just got in this movie does that mean i get to get my card they said yeah i mean you just got to pay the initiation i said okay done where where's the credit card um and so uh i got into sag and that i was very fortunate you know to be able to know I'm arriving in New York City with this thing that's going to open up some doors uh, for some of the more professional development jobs. And then, so, but then that fall, I got that email from SAG Boston because I was still on their email list. And it said, hey, there's this casting access project we're doing. Um, we'd love for you to either like to, to prepare this little tiny monologue from one of these three options. I picked one of them. I make, I, oh, first of all, I had a call to get an appointment. And so my my scene partner from the studio was, we, we were working on a scene or a scene that day at her apartment. And I said, listen, at two o'clock, would you do me a huge favor? Would you help me? I'm going to get on my cell phone. You get on your cell phone. Just keep dialing this number and until one of us gets an appointment. And she's the one that got the appointment. Uh, Victoria DJ uh, or Victoria DJ Smith, uh, who is uh, in L.A., uh and also one of my closest um so i got this audition uh i decided to take a bus to boston to do it and i'm i'm auditioning um with this one carolyn pickman who runs cp casting carolyn Pickman casting in boston <laughs> and i do the little monologue and she's looking at my headshot and she says you're not from boston are you and i said why do you say that she said because i'm I know the headshots. She said, this is a New York headshot. I said, okay, okay, okay. Hear me out. <laughs> I said, I was doing this in Boston for like two and a half years. You and I had never met at that point. And I said, I literally moved to New York like three months ago. So is it okay? And she said, well, can you can you be at my office later today? And I said, absolutely. She said, okay. So I go to her office. Now I'm I'm auditioning for the show. Uh, so essentially what it was, was like a kind of a pre-screen and then she was picking from that pre-screen to say, who's going to actually audition for the, the role. So I auditioned for this role, um, uh, for the show called Brotherhood, uh, that was coming out. Um, and I do it. 
it's crazy. I'm excited. Stay the night with a buddy of mine. I jump on a bus back to New York the next day. Um, the following day after that, I get a call from Carolyn and saying, can you be in Rhode Island tomorrow for the callback? <laughs> I was like, yes. So then I have to go to my restaurant and say, hey, you know that double I'm scheduled for tomorrow? So listen. And, you know, I will say to the credit of the industry in New York City, and, and I, I'm, I have never lived in L.A. for a long period of time. And so I haven't really worked in the restaurant game there. So I don't know if it's the same, but I know it kind of feels like it would be. But they were just super supportive, right? They were like, wow, yeah, you got to call back for this TV show? Yeah, of course you can go do that. Um, jump back on a bus the next morning, head to Rhode Island, do the callback with the director and the writer. And again, this is this is all new. I'm just like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, I'm just trying to just play, you know? And uh, I leave and I'm back on the bus again. And, you know, it's a four hour bus ride from, from New York to Boston. And on the way back, I get the call from Carolyn Pickman's office and they said, hey, you got that part. And so, I'm, by the way, I'm really good at telling super long stories to get to your question. <laughs> <laughs> I love so, it. No, keep going, I get the role in the show. I get this. I get the role in the show. It was an amazing experience. It ends up being a whole week of work. And I'm working with Jason Isaacs and I'm meeting uh, Len Carew, you know, who I knew from listening to Sondheim's A Little Night Music. It was just surreal, man. And then, um, oh, uh, uh, Jason. Uh, oh, I'm blanking on his name. That's OK. I'll I'll remember all these. I'll remember these when we're done talking. Um, but anyway, the point is, it was a great experience. Fast forward a year, uh, and I get a call from the production. They said, hey, they want to bring your character back for season two. And I said, oh, my gosh, that's amazing. I get off the phone. Immediately, I talked to my roommate, because my roommate has representation at that point, and I don't. And I said, listen, I'm not asking them to represent me full time. I'm not even asking for an audition for that. What I would love is just to make sure that someone on the phone to do this thing for me, this deal, because the year before, because I had gone to Boston to audition, I was considered a local hire. And so when I got booked, I did not realize it was going to be a week. And so I had to spend a week in in, uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, but I had to pay, you know, for all the housing and the transportation and all that stuff. So essentially, whatever I earned from that show went, paid off all that, which was fine, you know. You gotta, you gotta spend money to make money, and I, I, you know, it was an investment. And so, but this time, I was like, I'm in New York. I've been here over a year. Please, just don't make me have to pay for everything again. And so, he talked to his agent, and then I talked with him, and I just, and I think it was the way again, you know, the way you approach it is important. Is to say, like, I'm not trying to take advantage of you. What I need is this job, and I just need help doing the deal, and then we can just go our separate ways. Um, and her name was Nancy Clarkin. Uh, she worked for this agency called Hard Aleppo at the time. And um, yeah, she got on the phone with me and said, no problem, you know, happy to do it and made it work. And, it, you know, just made sure that I was going to be hired as a, a traveling actor. And um, after that, she said, uh, hey, you know, We'd love to meet you. The office would like to meet you. Um, so let's set up some time. And, um, you know, and that's kind of when that began. Uh, I got to go in. I met, it was a small boutique agency as well. So there were, there were three agents. Uh, and I just had a really good chat. And, uh, but still, man, still so green and naive. I showed up wearing a suit. Like I, I approached this and I did this with my commercial agent too, the first time I met with them. I, I wasn't, I thought this was an interview, right? So I show up like I was taught to do in college, like suit and tie and very well put together. And, and uh, <laughs> I definitely stuck out to them. I could definitely feel that they were like, oh, this guy, this guy's really new, really, really new. Um, it was cool, man. They just said, you, you know, we'd love to, um, what's the term? Uh, what is it when they don't sign you, but they work with you? Like, uh, like hip pocket you? Kind of. Yeah. Like, yeah. like we want to see how we want to see what, what, what happens. Like we're going to throw you against some walls and see if you stick, you know? <laughs> um, 
uh, freelance. They wanted to freelance with me. Oh, um, okay. And then I I learned from my my roommate. He said, "Wow, they don't freelance. They don't freelance." And I was like, "Okay, well, they do now." <laughs> um, and man, I got lucky. I I was with them. I was freelancing with them, and within four months, I had booked like three or four jobs. Um, yeah. <laughs> And so it helped. It really helped to kind of give them the confidence that like, hey, you can sign me. And I think I think we'll have a pretty good thing going on. Um, so that's kind of how I came about getting my representation. And it, I, again, I'm, I feel very lucky at how it went about. It's a little different than, than other journeys. Um, one thing I always tell uh, younger actors, you know, that I'm coaching or, or that I have questions about it. I'm, I always say, hey, you know, where are you from? And what's going on where you're from? Like, is there any kind of production? Do movies or TV shows ever come to where you're from and do something, you know? Um, well, yeah, sometimes. And I say, all right, well, listen, keep an eye on it. See what's coming into your town. And when it's coming into your town, talk to your family, talk to your friends, whomever, and see if you can stay with them for a little bit. And then try to go find the casting people that are doing a local hire and give it a shot because the smaller markets especially if you you know if you're in this for the the end game if you're if you want to be an artist and that, that's your that's what you're going to do then um you kind of have nothing to lose on that move and you have so much to gain because you're going to stick out you know you're going to pop a little more because i i found the people that are committed their time and their energy to, to taking classes, to studying, to understanding techniques and processes. And, and um, you're going to show a little bit differently than the local hires that might be interested in doing it. They just haven't really done it before, you know? Um, and so, yeah, smaller markets is always a good way to go because it did, it worked out for me that way, you know? Um, and then you hope you get lucky and be on something like I was that happened to have a character that they said, Oh, it'd be cool if we put him in an episode in the next season. Because then, you know, I was able to bring something to the agency. That was the key, right? Like, they were going to get 10% of whatever I was going to earn. And we don't even, I'm not even signed with them. But I, I was in good faith saying, I'll give you the money. You know, that's, and I think the idea is like, you got to be, you got to show them that you understand that like, this is a partnership, right? Yeah. It's interesting now, years later. Uh, and it's taken a long time for me to kind of come to this understanding and, and is that, you know, they, you are paying them to work for you. Right. So you can get a little more confidence in, in the idea of like, if someone doesn't want to sign you, you're better off because if they don't believe in you, then what's the point of what we're doing? You know, you want someone that sees you and says, Oh man, I'm buying into what you're selling. Um, but more importantly, you got to be a hustler. And you got to get out there and find some work. Um, and, and that's what I'm saying. Small market's a great way to think about it. Uh, nowadays, it's, it's you know, Boston is a hub. Um, it's fascinating. I'm, I'm actually, I have a, a, a buddy of mine who I did my first commercial with ever. Uh, his name's Michael Malvesti. And uh, I hadn't talked to Michael in quite some time, but he reached out. And uh, not long ago, we just started chatting and stuff. and, and um, you know, he's he's doing huge things now because he stayed in Boston. He's got a family. You know, he lives in Quincy, Mass. Um, but he was he's on uh, the Boston Strangler on Hulu right now. Great role. Great role. Great at it. He was in City on a Hill. Like, he opened the show City on a Hill. His scene is, like, he plays this uh, armed, uh, armored truck driver guy. It's just an amazing scene. Anyway, the idea is that, like, because he's popping, in Boston, and because Boston just has a ton of work now, you know, oh, it was yeah. just super exciting to see, like, he's getting work without having to worry about making a move, you know, at, at, at a time in his life where it's kind of difficult to do so. So, but yeah, we have Atlanta now. Uh, New Orleans has a scene going on. Austin, New Mexico. So there's some really cool opportunities for actors wherever you live. And of course, what we learned from following the pandemic and the shutdowns is that now people are auditioning from anywhere they are on tape. You know, everyone's putting themselves on tape. And trust me when I say, Tyler, like if I if I could figure out how to make 
Colorado, my home again, and still get some work in LA or New York, then I'm I'm going to make that work. You know, I'm going to make that happen. Or that's not fair. My wife's also from Illinois. So that's also on the table. <laughs> <laughs> no, come to Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell Jenny you said that. She's gonna love me. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, I just think so. Today's today's even more opportunity to try something like that. Um, but yeah, back then it wasn't as uh available, but cities like Philadelphia, Boston, um any major city, Chicago definitely had some production going on there at that time too. Um, and so but nowadays, so if you wanted to do, if you were thinking small market back then, it's like, you can do that now. You can get agents down in Atlanta now. You know, uh, I have friends in North Carolina who are actors who have agents and they tend to just audition for all the Atlanta jobs that are out there. And I mean, they have everything, you know, they, like they have all the Marvel stuff. Ozark uh, was a big one down there. I mean, they, they, they have their hands in a lot of pies in Atlanta in production. So, um, but yeah, I just, I was very lucky to get to kind of where I was uh, just on that kind of hustle. Yeah. And you know what, man, I, I think it's a great trajectory for others to think about who are starting this too. Not to say, you know, book something big first and then, you know, get reps, but the idea of going in, going with the flow, just seeing what happens. Right. And I, I do yeah. feel a little seen when you talked about meeting your, <laughs> your reps uh, in a suit because I did the same thing for my reps here when I first picked up an agent because I didn't know what to do. It's Colorado. Nobody knows, you know, like what, what a meeting is. Yeah. So you're just like, oh, oh, you wanted me. So you, oh yeah, I'll, I'll listen. I'm going to hear. Like we could show up. We could have yeah. shown up wearing what we're wearing right now. Exactly. And it probably would have been even more interesting and more of a dynamic meeting because they'd be like, well, who's this guy? Yeah. You, like, know, you look so guy, relaxed. This guy, this guy rolls. Yeah. <laughs> No, I man, I love those stories, especially when it's it's almost like a, a a weird experience of happenstance where these different connections are kind of popping up. And um, I don't want to get too like philosophical or cosmic, but you know, every acting coach will say like the universe will provide. Yeah, you're talking to the right guy for this. See, so. there we go. Yeah. yeah, it's just like you know, just going in, no expectations, and seeing what happens, and and look what what life brings to you. And leave this, your heart, leave it open, mm -hmm. leave it open to that energy, to that idea, to the, you know, my, my, Jenny, my wife, um, is my wife of, uh, you know, six years, we've been together 11 years, is one of the most important people in the world to me. And she is the one that introduced me to um, the artist way. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. A little but, bit, yeah. roughly. So we did that. And I mean, it's an incredible process. It's, it's hard. For a lot of people, because it kind of forces you to really ask some questions of yourself that can be hard to answer. Um, but we, she introduced me to it, and one of the things that it really touched on was this: this idea that there's there's a bigger thing going on. There's an energy out there. There's a creator of sort, you know, a creator. We we were created. This everything was created by something, um, you know, and everyone has the thing that they need uh, uh, to answer that question. And the cool thing is use that and be open to it. And, and that's one of the things is we do mantras and, and I, I try to leave myself open every day to say, whatever, whatever's coming my way today, I'm going to take it. I'll accept it. No problem. And, uh, you know, some days, some days the call is answered and most of the days it's not, but it certainly starts the day off better because you start to kind of look for different things to say like, oh, is that? Was that something that a sign for me? Was that a sign for me? And then, man, once you do that, it's kind of incredible what ends up all the little coincidences that start to happen. And you're like, you get to a point, you're like, that, that's not a coincidence. It's impossible that that was a coincidence, considering what I was just asking for, you know? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. man, I'm with you. I think I think energy and 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 leaving yourself open to possibility is super important in what we do. Absolutely. And especially yeah. when it comes to starting your career, you know, you, like you said, you, you picked up reps, those reps a year later, you know, the, the things were happening. And as you were booking and things started to get traction, I mean, what was going through your head at that moment? Were you thinking, well, uh, I'm going to go full force with this or like, what was going oh, yeah. through your head as like, <laughs> yeah, I was going to go full the force. New black? <laughs> the, 
it was so fascinating because you know you go full force um and then you kind of you know you learn some lessons like again you and i being from a place where going to the movies was such a special cool thing for us and and seeing going man i want to do this this is something i love to do no idea how to do it there's never a conversation around it where we're from um but you you know I don't know if this happened with you, but I just know after some of my first few bookings, I was like, oh, I'm here I go. Here I go. Here comes the fame. So good. Goodbye, bar. Goodbye, restaurant. Like, you know, it's been a good three years, but I'm good. I'm I'm taking off, you know, and then you realize, no, 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 no. That's that is not how this works. <laughs> um, you'll get a job and you'll get a fun little paycheck for that job. And then you'll spend another six months trying to find another job. And then you spend that paycheck and you're like, oh, okay. Okay. So there's a difference. There's a, there's a difference between celebrity and kind of what I'm doing. Right. But then you, then I started to pay attention to that. And, and, and I tried to find spaces where I could work during the day, whatever I needed to do my hustle job to make money. I just needed to know I, had, I needed to love it outside of acting. Um, and that's why restaurants always stuck with me because uh, I'll be honest, if I wasn't, if I wasn't doing this, uh, I'd probably be a chef. Uh, I, I, I love food. I love cooking. Um, I love the restaurant business. I, I love all aspects. And I've worked, you know, dishwasher at a dive bar in Colorado Springs. Uh, and I've worked as a bartender and at one of the, you know, most expensive steakhouses in the city, you know, like, so I've done it all levels of it and i just i love it i think it's an awesome awesome business um and so i would always just kind of try to find a restaurant that i, I really liked what i was selling you know the i liked the food and, and i would stick it out and then i ended up um i got real lucky again and got a job at this bar called off the wagon uh which is a bar in, in uh greenwich village and uh <laughs> strangely enough Heidi had told me about that bar when I first moved to New York. She said, there's a bar in the village, and I think it's owned by a guy that went to CSU, <laughs> Colorado State University. And I was like, what? That's crazy. I got to find this place. Because, and if anyone, if you ever, if you and I ever get to hang out or, or you know, in person, if I meet anybody from Colorado, probably much to their chagrin. I'm like, yo, we're best friends now. You're from Colorado. I'm from Colorado. We grew up in the greatest state in the world, so clearly we're going to be besties. And so I had this idea I was going to go to that bar and be like, who's the guy from Colorado owns the bar? Because I want to be his friend. Um, turns out it was a guy from New Jersey who did go to Colorado State for a semester, dropped out, ended up in Aspen. <laughs> Met this guy, uh, Rob Howard. Danny and Rob uh, were working at this bar in Aspen for a long time called the Red Line, ended up coming to New York and then getting into this bar game. And so then Danny and Rob did open off the wagon. And so it did turn out though when I interviewed with Howie, Rob, Rob Howard is his name, he goes by Howie. When I interviewed with Howie, like the fact that I was from Colorado, that I was a diehard Broncos fan, because it's a sports bar, diehard Broncos fan. But at the time I was a Red Sox fan, because I'm older than you. And although I'm repping the CR now, I was in college when the Rockies came in. And so I didn't even really care about baseball. I didn't pay attention to it. But you moved to Boston. And you either, if you want to, if you want to really have a good time, either be a, be a diehard Red Sox fan or just don't be a Yankees fan. Um, but if you're, if you're a Red Sox fan, you know, they really embrace you pretty quick. And so I, and they, the Red Sox taught me about baseball. I learned everything about professional baseball by watching that team. So when Howie found out that I was a Red Sox and a Broncos guy, and then I find out he's the same, and he's from South Carolina, by the way. I mean, it was just like, how is this, how is this happening right now? Like, this couldn't be any better. And then I got hired, you know, and uh, I worked there for four or five years, man. That was a bar. It was great. And because they were super flexible about my acting schedule, because I was, I was auditioning and I, and I was booking some work here and there. Um, and in fact, yeah, I booked Orange. Um, I actually was on a trip in to LA just to visit friends. And I got a self-tape request for Orange while I was in LA, which was crazy to me because 
I had not been, I had not auditioned for Orange for the entire first three seasons while it was in New York. While I was here, I'd never had an audition for them. So it was so strange to me. I was like, it's so bizarre that the one day I get an audition for Orange is the New Black, I happen to be in LA and now I got to hustle. And I'm telling you though, man, about talking about networking and being friend, having your friends around. I was like out to lunch with three of my friends. Um, and I said, hi guys, I just got this self tape. I don't know what to do. And they said, all right, we're going to go to his apartment. Uh, we're going to grab my camera. And Jeff, do you have lights? Yeah, I've got some lights. And then uh, uh, Candace, can you do the, can you be a reader? And we taped it and booked it and changed my life. Yeah. And so once I got orange, um, did the first season, the four season four is when I started. And I, and that was an interesting experience because I never knew if I was coming back, you know, they didn't, we were all the new kind of characters that were introduced that season. There were a lot of us. You know, we didn't have full fleshed out arcs necessarily. We were there to support, you know, the main cast. And so you didn't really know if you were going to be there the next week, the next episode or not. But it would just kind of keep happening. And and again, the bar was super cool about it for a little bit. <laughs> it got a little hairy towards the end because, <laughs> you know, you could call out <laughs> the, 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 the philosophy of this bar. And it works, by the way. I just want to say it is, it's brilliant is that you get your shifts because people come in to see you. And so on this day, they're coming and they expect to see this face and it's going to do well for the bar. It's going to do well for everybody. But when your face kind of keeps dropping out and somebody else is there and they're coming to see you, then they might start com stop coming. And uh, it, so it got a little hairy there. And then I got the call about season five and they, they said, you know, this one, this one, there's there's a guarantee in them, right? You know, like you're going to guarantee you this many episodes of the season. And it was like fun. I got the call while I was at the bar. It was a Friday afternoon. And, you know, I had one of those awesome fun actor moments where I hung up the phone and I said, shots are on me, baby. Like, let's go. Cause uh, I'm putting in my two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. I did. I put in my two weeks that day. And then, um, uh, you know, then I just worked on Orange pretty uh, exclusively for the next uh, two or three years. Wow, man. And have you, and speaking on this, uh, you know, working a hustle job or a day job, have you had to revisit, you know, working for? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm doing it right now. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, the pandemic, as we all know, like it, it affected every single one of us um, in many, many different ways, but in very similar ways. Um and I think for a lot of us, it was a big reset, um, especially in the arts, you know? Um, and I know it was hard for everybody because nobody was working, you know? And so there was this, my thought was, hey, if when it starts to come back online, it's gonna be tough to find a gig because everybody's gonna wanna work. And ev for the most part, no one's gonna have, um, a lot of nitpicking to do. Like, it's like, oh, you want me to do this show? I'll do the show. I don't care what the script is. I just want to get in front of a camera. I just want to work again, you know? And so um, at the time, right before the pandemic, uh, um, I was pretty fortunate. I was able to, I wasn't really working a hustle at that point. Uh, but then that happened. And, and then coming out of it, um, just was doing some odd jobs. I, I did, uh, I drove for Uber Eats for a while. Um, realized that that is not very fun. Uh, it's also not good on a 45 year old body. <laughs> uh, and I got, I got lucky and fell into this gig. I work now for the public theater here in New York city, which is uh, an off Broadway theater that um, has produced, you know, some titles here and there. I don't know if you've heard of Hamilton, but it, it came out of the public and there's always a joke oh. about it. And it's hilarious. Oh, it's like but a I small am a delivery time show, right? It's small time. Yeah. yeah like they yeah. just kind of, you know, some off Broadway, you know, um, but they, uh, I got, I, I'm a delivery driver, um, for the theater and it's amazing because right now they're getting ready to do, uh, have you been to New York city? I, last time I was there was 2015. Okay. So they do this thing in central park, Shakespeare in the park, um, which is an amazing thing they do. It's free. You just got to get there like five in the morning to line up for the tickets. Um, but it's produced and it's put on by the public theater. In fact, it started, I think the public started 
kind of with this premise of Shakespeare in the Park by this guy, Joe Papp. And Joe Papp also was the, the founder and, and he began the public theater. But this was a way to like really get back to community. And since then, it's just, I mean, they, they produced the best plays, the best Shakespeare, because you're outside at this outdoor theater in Central Park. So it feels like you're literally in a, you know, there's no, you can see the cityscape like far away, but it, it's just, it's just magical. It is a magical experience. Highly recommend next time you're here, especially during the summer, because that's when they do it. Try to go see one of their shows. Um, and uh, it's just cool because now I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm loaded. I help drive product, you know, lighting and sound and, and uh, scenery, you know, from the public to the, to the Delacorte theater. And it's like, I'm watching the sets get built. And, you know, last year, my last summer is when I really started doing it. And like at a the time they had just finished Richard three and they were going to do uh, love labors lost and, and like, and just to see the things and to be able to touch some of these props, you know, they did, um, the public did raisin in the sun this fall, a revival of that play with Tanya Pinkins uh, playing the, the matriarch. And, uh, <laughs> I had to go to New Jersey to pick up this table that fit the time period for the play. And there was just this moment of reverence for me to say like, I'm bringing this table to be in the production of Raising on the Sun with Tanya Pinkins. I was like, so even though I wasn't acting, right? Even though I was doing a hustle job and yeah, go, I will say going from having some consistent work and being on a television show and, and, you know, by this last season, you know, you know, I was, I was employed for the entire season, you know, to go from that kind of situation where you think like, okay, I'm good now. Um, and then you, you realize like, oh, okay, uh, no, you gotta, gotta kind of get back to it. It can be really hard. And I would say to anybody also maybe struggling with that too, again, try to find a hustle that fulfills you in a way that can like it doesn't fill the void necessarily of not being able to just be in the moment as an actor but it will give you something to say like this is a good thing to hold on to to keep my hopes to keep the the dream alive to keep the the want for the the other thing um and i get to see co-workers that i really enjoy being around um but the what I, what really helped me was to find the moments like I said, of like that table, touching that table, for me was a, a very visceral moment to me to say, this is awesome because I'm the, I am somehow part of this. So I might not be acting in it, but I'm part of a production. And as long as I'm in the production world, I have a lot of friends uh, who have gone to do PA work on film sets. Uh, I have a buddy who he ended up joining the... Um, he ended up joining uh, Yahtzee, the union, to, for stage building. And he builds, like, when he's not working as an actor, he's building shows for Lady Gaga. Like, they're building out those shows in stadiums and stuff. And that's, what, that's, how, he, that's how he makes money when he's, not, when he's not auditioning and acting. And so um, I definitely think if you're an artist and you're feeling a little uh, anxious, um, if you're not acting and you're working some job to pay rent, and you're kind of having a tough time with it, just do some exploring, see what theater companies are around, see if they need paid positions for anything, you know? And I think it would, it, for me, it really, it really made a huge difference, you know, and I'm still doing it today. I, you know, uh, I, and I, I had to write down, sorry, I had to write down that, that one part. We always do um, advice for each episode. Oh, right on. So I love the idea of do some exploring, especially yeah, when yeah, you're yeah. in that gutter. Uh, no, but keep going. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Oh, no, that's it. But that's it. Right. So, um, you know, and it was kind of an interesting situation because when I was doing that this summer. Um, uh, I then got this audition um, and it was it was for uh, for the Joker and the second the second uh, installment of the Joker. And, um, you know, when I got the job. You know, now it's theater works and, and there's there's slow times in theater, too. So. It just, it was happenstance that they were like, well, we don't really need the extra hire right now. And I was like, that's okay. Cause I gotta go, I gotta go to LA for three, you know, three weeks. And, um, but then I come back and was able to go right back to the public and say, Hey, I'm back if you need me. Right. And they were like, actually we do need somebody. So, 
So it's just, it's just been an interesting thing because it's like I go, I went from you know working on Orange and then and then not having anything and then and then I had something and then I didn't have anything and then I had the public and I was like, cool, this is fun and maybe I'll get some auditions. And then I get this audition, it's this big thing, and I get that thing, and then come back from that thing and I'm like, I don't have anything again. Um, but I could come back to the public and and now I've got something that I got that I will be doing in May and you know. The other good news is that I don't think I'm hurting this company. That's the hard part about restaurants. Like I said, it, it, I was always in this really sp weird space because I was like, for instance, in the interview for the bar, there's three people you got to interview, right? You know, three three owners of the bar. And uh, when I met Rodney, and Rodney is, is one of the best human beings on earth, but he's born and raised in Brooklyn. You know, he came up through the bar business. This specific specific bar company started out as a bouncer and worked his way up, and then ends up being a partner for this bar. But he's chatting me. He's like, "So you're an actor, huh?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah, I'm an actor." You know, because everybody, for the most part, most people in the restaurant business in New York and LA are somehow doing some sort of art. Um, I said, "Yeah, yeah, I'm an actor." And he says, "Well, all right, let me ask you something." He's like, "Are we going to see you? Or are you going to are you going to be de leaving a lot?" And I'm like. It's a hard thing to answer, right? Because at that time, I, I was getting work. Um, so I've, I've also found to always be honest. Um, and so I just told him the truth. I said, yeah, I do. I do work here and there. I said, look, it's probably once every couple of months I'll have an audition that, that goes well. I said, but the good news is I'm not gone for more than a day. You know, it's usually a one-day thing. If it's any more, I will definitely have the information. You know, but because I was honest, but, but then, you know, I just, I just started booking stuff. And, and like, like I said, a couple of years in, I started really booking. And then that's when we were like, might be better for both of us to uh, call it a day, you know? Um, but I would just say like, you know, be prepared to, to be honest with whoever's with whoever they are, because again, if they're not gonna be able to support you, it's just gonna be really stressful. And yeah. if you get an audition, you end up, I would stress so much about getting a shift covered so I could get this audition done or get prepared for it, you know, and that would cause a headache. And then, you know, sometimes I felt like I turned in kind of crappy auditions. I'd show up to the room and I just didn't have the energy or just, I didn't get to do all the work I'd want to do. Right. Um, but it's a hard thing to do because unfortunately we live, we live in a world where money talks and rent is important. And so you got it, you got to figure that out. Um, but that's what I'm saying. Coming back to this, like, I feel very lucky that, you know, even at the age of 47, working somehow in a production space when I'm not acting has, has served me enough and fills me enough that the only thing now is like, I just need to make sure I'm around acting, right? Like, so a, a buddy of mine recently started this um, acting salon on, the, on a Sunday night, it's every second Sunday of the month. And we meet at this place, he's a bartender. Um, and he got permission from the, his boss to take over their private dining space on every second Sunday of the month. And we just have a big salon and you can bring in anything you want to work on. If you want to have a scene read from something you're writing or if you want to do a monologue or you're working on an audition, you just bring it in. Or you can just sit around, drink wine and bullshit uh, about acting. And, and, and you know, it's um, finding community is really important, you know having a community of artists so if you're not working if you're not auditioning at least you're around people and you can have you have the same vocabulary and the same wants and needs and desires so even just going to one of those things and saying let's go see a movie together and then going and talking about that movie you will fill a space i think artistically um in a temporarily you know in a temporary way uh until you can get that next audition so that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm doing the public, my buddy Salon, uh, working with this other group uh, called The Artist Experiment. Uh, it's a small little production company uh, that's a nonprofit. Our whole purpose is to tell people, if you have something you want to get made, come to us because we will figure out how to get it made. You know, we'll, We will reach out to the different contacts we have and, and get that stuff made. But if you can do that, um, it does make it a little easier when you're not actually booking the paid gigs, you know? Yeah, yeah. Honestly, man, it sounds like you you were surrounding yourself with your passion, you know. So not yeah, not trying. a single day. I'm sure there's down days, but not a single day is just 
you know, you're sitting in the car or you're standing outside of the bar that you're going to go work at and you're just taking that deep breath like, ah, okay, all right, well, let's do it. And you just stroll well, on. Well, in. <laughs> there, there have been definitely plenty of those days, plenty, <laughs> trust me. I mean, and that's that's the nature of it, you know, I think, and it is. And I think those are the days. That's the Those are the moments that I'm thankful now, what I know, um, but I'd love to go talk to myself, you know, six or seven years ago when I was deaf. You know, it was interesting after Orange was over. Um, I kind of fell victim to that that assumption. Like, oh, I just worked as a recurring guest star for, you know, three years on this show. And, you know, I I would get recognized every time I would travel, every airport I would go through, someone would recognize me from the show. You know, I just thought that's just going to carry, you know, that's just going to kind of carry me to the next thing. And I'll get another recurring gig on something, or maybe I'll get a, a lead role or something, you know. And dude, I, I mean, I didn't work for two years after Orange. So, wow. um, so that's 2016 was when we finished Orange. Yeah. So like until 2018, I didn't book a, a job. Um, so yeah, there were those days, man. There were those days. And it was, uh, you know, it was hard, but I'd love to go back and just try to tell him like, Hey, most important thing is find something artistic to do in the meantime. Um, and I, I say this to other artists as well, especially ones that are new and kind of coming to new cities and doing the thing, like go find the community theater, go find backstage, wherever they're public, like wherever you can get a hold of that backstage, find auditions. And I don't care. Non-union doesn't matter. Just find auditions. Because just the process of auditioning and preparing, it's surprisingly how much it, it w- would fill the well, you know? Yeah. So yeah, Well, and, and speaking on everything you've experienced within your career, I, I'm i interested to see what you have to say about this. But I wanted to see if you have a party story you could share with the listeners. So not something that happened at a party necessarily, but an experience or a moment or a day that occurred uh, within your acting career that stands out so immensely, you would tell friends at a party, no problem. You know, they're usually funny. They could be yes. horrific. They could be tragic, but uh, yeah. Do you have something you could share with us? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot, man. I, I'm very lucky. I just want to say I'm very lucky. Um, but I got to do, uh, I was fortunate enough to be in a Steven Spielberg movie. Okay. I got one line. And I just remember when my agent called and said, hey, so Bridge of Spies, uh, they'd love to book you. Um, it's just one line. And I was like, what? I don't, I don't care. Like, this is Steven Spielberg. I get to be on a Steven Spielberg movie and on the set. I don't, fine, I, whatever. I don't, I don't even have to say anything, you know. And I got to do this one line. But it was really cool was the day that I got to shoot. The first day, um, first of all, meeting Tom Hanks was just a dream. And, and uh, as everyone has said on every TV show, podcast they've ever been interviewed for, if you've met him, he is as nice as they say he is. He's just a lovely person. Really cool to meet him. But then there was this moment where we broke, right? Uh, to change the setups. And we're on the, and this is in the courtroom scene in, in, in the movie. So we're on the judges' chambers because this was actually at Queen Superior Courthouse, and uh, we're in the judges' chambers, and I'm sitting there, and it's me, and Amy Ryan, and Alan Alda, Tom Hanks, um, Mark Rylance was there, uh, and, and then, and then Steven Spielberg comes in, and the thing is, we're sitting there, and Alan Alda is talking. He's telling a story about how he didn't he hadn't started school until he was later in his years like nine because his father was a vaudeville performer and they he traveled with his parents while his dad did vaudeville for the most of his young life and then once they got and settled in new york that's when he started going to school but like he was clearly born to to be who he is and he's just telling this story and i'm like I'm just staring at him because I'm like, I can hear your voice because you're Alan Alda. I've known this voice since I was a kid because my parents used to watch MASH and like, it was just surreal. 
then I'm like, this guy's telling a story. And he would like, you know, he's telling stories. He's looking at all of us. And anytime, anytime anybody during this story would catch eyes with me, I'd try to be like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, because I was like a mouth agape. And then Spielberg comes in. And I don't know how it started. But then we started talking about how they were growing up during the polio vaccine. And so now they're having a conversation. And Spielberg's telling a story in which it goes on for a bit. And then somehow he's talking about how he pulls up one day and like Mo from the Three Stooges, he was in front of Mo's house and Mo is mowing his lawn. And like, and I'm just, I'm just like, I cannot believe this is happening. Right now. I cannot believe I'm hearing these stories from these people and I'm included in the audience, you know? Again, looking at me and I'm just, I'm trying everything I can to keep it together. And the reality is about me and anybody that you talk to that's worked with me, I am, I'm starstruck still all the time. And I think that's the Colorado in us, to be honest with you. I really think it's growing up somewhere like that. And like anything that we saw in movie, it was just so impossible to, to even think that I could reach that and, and touch that and see these people. I'm never going to see these people. And I do, I have a friend, his name's Renee Ifra. He's an amazing actor. He and I, I got to do my first feature film um, was taking a Pelham one, two, three, the remake. And Renee played my partner. And I just remember when we met and we hit it off real quick, uh, still best friends to this day. Um, I was doing that. Like the first shot, the first thing I see on my first day on set is they bring me in and we're going up to First Avenue, right where the United Nations is. And there's a big crane and there's a cop car dangling from this crane over First Avenue by this overpass. And I'm walking and I'm like, what is happening? And it turns out what the, the shot is this big stunt sequence in which they're gonna drop this car because the idea is that I'm driving this car and it flips over this guardrail because we get hit by an ambulance. And so they, they're dropping the car and there's this whole choreography of cars and motorcycles hitting that car, running by that car. It's just nuts. It's this huge thing. And I'm like kid in a candy store. I can't believe it. And Renee is kind of watching me. And at one point he says, hey, don't ever lose. Don't ever lose that. Whatever is happening right to you, don't lose it. He's like, it'll really serve you. And it does, man. I have no qualms with being starstruck with walking around going, this is incredible. I mean, when I got to do the Joker, you know, again, can't talk too much about it. What I can say is that I'll, I wrote down, I, in my notes app on my iPhone, when Todd called action for the first time. Because I'd never been on the first day of a movie. I had never, and that's the, I, I love, I love this stuff, man. Tyler, I love movies and acting and, 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 um, telling story, right? And so another thing I was, if we're doing an advice, any kind of advice, just don't lose it. Don't lose that, that wowness factor. Cause it'll never get, it never gets old. It doesn't, if you allow it to let you, if you allow it in, it'll never get old. It'll always be exciting. Cause you're always gonna meet cool people. And, and you know, when I got to do the movie, she said, um, and I'm playing Harvey Weinstein, right? And, and I'm scared to death because this is clearly at the at that time you know it's one of the biggest things that's ever come to me and you know knowing how they were going to shoot it knowing the the way it was going to be that you know you were never going to see my face but the way that the ensemble embraced me as an artist was mind-blowing and again like meeting Patricia Clarkson and Carrie Mulligan and Zoe Kazan um, and Andre Bauer, like, I couldn't, I couldn't lose it. I just, I was like, this is the best. This is the best. And, and I'm so proud of being around these people and being a peer, you know, with them. But yeah, I just, I think if you lose the idea that like, no, this is big. This is, these are people that like are telling story in big ways. So always, always be in it, man, and, and enjoy it and be a kid. You know, do your job, <laughs> show up, know your lines, know your marks, know your lighting, you know, have your choices made. <laughs> Man, when they call cut and just don't bother anybody, <laughs> you know, don't take, definitely take in the room, figure out who's kind of chatty and who's not. You know, I've, I've worked with some amazing actors and 
I worked with one actor who is a very committed when he plays his roles and he's a super sweet dude, but not when you're shooting and not even in between shots because he stays in, you know, he's, he's a method guy. And I didn't know that. And I tried to start a conversation with him one day because it was just he and I in this, this one day of shooting, it was just he and I in the scene. And uh, <laughs> we were in between shots and I sat down and I said, Hey, so how was your weekend? You know? And, you know, he was nice. He, he started and he's like, oh, you know, it was good. It's good. I was, uh, went to, uh, you know, I went to Chicago and then, um, you know, just hung out. I was like, oh, that's awesome, man. That's great. I, I love Chicago. And we sit there for a few more seconds and then he just gets up, not without a word, just walks to the other side of the auditorium room and just sits down. And, but Tyler, I thought I was done. I thought I was going to be fired. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And no, it just turns out, so my character and is an antagonist to his character in the in the show, right? Yeah. Like he doesn't like me. His character does not like my character. And so I I learned something in that moment. I was like, oh, that's amazing. Like he's letting it still live. Like he doesn't like me. And it took me a few weeks to go, oh Mike, it wasn't it's not it wasn't Mike that he didn't like. He didn't like Ralph. And you were Ralph and you were trying to have a conversation with him, and he was like, I don't want to talk to you, you know, and got up and I was like, and it just was an incredible thing, but I definitely learned like, get to know who you're working with, <laughs> slowly, slow, slowly short it out. So you don't just start launching into something and then realize that, oh, you're in character this whole time. And I probably affected our entire relationship on camera as much as off. <laughs> I, I honestly, I think you're right. It is the Colorado in us that has that, <laughs> you know, you were on a screen. Um, and now I'm talking to you, but you know, um, our facade is, you know, pretty well kept. We're just, we're just social, right? We want to, we want to, yeah. and I honestly think I, I feel a lot better about like the biggest thing I've ever done is a movie with, uh, Jeremy Renner and Elizabeth Olsen. And it was uh -huh. shot as an indie. So all of us hung out in this abandoned trailer that was part of the set in between shots. So I'm just hanging out and then I'm listening to. Liz talk about civil war and what she just shot in Atlanta. And then Graham green comes in and tells like one of the most inappropriate jokes possible. And I like, uh -oh. I'm sweating thinking about it going, where, where am I? This, this is ridiculous. So no, I completely relate yeah. to that hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Listen, Tyler, don't ever lose it. Like no, no one should ever lose that. <laughs> and I mean, I, I'm proud of us Coloradans for saying, no, no, man, we're going to, we're going to be who we are. We grew up very fortunate to have sunny days, 300 days out of the year, uh, which has given us a ton of vitamin D. So we're usually in a pretty good mood. <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah, that's, and I love that. That's a great question, man. A good party story. That's yeah, a great question. I think this was, uh, I usually have to explain the meaning of it more than once. Just because it's a weird question to ask, like, oh, a story <laughs> at a party? <laughs> well, I was going to be like, oh, well, so I was at this party, yeah, with a bunch of actors once, and this one guy told me, acting's like golf, and I was going to tell you that story, and I was like, oh, no, 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 you're talking about, like, okay, copy, copy, copy. <laughs> yeah. I, at some point, I'll rephrase it, but for I'm just too lazy to do it, you know, there's no, no. being I, done. What I should have done, I should have long said, well, dude, listen, man, there was this keg stand about two years ago, and I probably shouldn't have been doing it, but it was amazing, and I don't remember who it was. That 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 should have been how I launched in. I was I was waiting for a, okay. It was me. It was Joaquin Phoenix, and it was Lady Gaga. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no sir, no sir. That's that. That's a good example of one of those actors that like you're you. You are in that actor's. You are in his space as his character at all times. Um, and what I found fascinating about not only working with him, but just any actor I've worked with that, that's really um, adept at, at, at using the method. Is that, because I, that was intimidating at first, uh, because I, you know, I'm, not a, I'm not a method person per se. Uh, I, try to, I try to take pieces from a lot of different techniques. One of my favorites is Brian Cranston, and, and he once did this interview in which he said, you know, you have a toolbox and an actor has a toolbox and, and you have a lot of different tools and you know, you might, pull this tool from from Strasbourg from sense memory you might pull this tool um or, or sorry from uh, I forgot what his Strasbourg is the one where you kind of go back and you're way deep 
and you know, have to remember a smell from a you know, from a really tough memory or something. But then the method, you know, you do sense memory work and 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 really knowing the the job you're doing. Um, and so I like to take those pieces. My foundation is Meisner. That's the William Esper Studio is a Meisner intensive studio for, for two years. So that's my foundation. But I like to pull from other things. But so I was intimidated working with method actors because I thought, well, how do I how do I adjust to that? Because if they're going to be in character the whole time, and I, I just, I'm not. And when we call cut, like, because I have, for me, it's just, I don't know, for my mental health and just all, a lot of different ways. It's like it's good for me to just be able to use my imagination, and and not try to hold on to to real events. Um, but that's for me. Uh, it works for a lot of people, and it works brilliantly. Um, and I would never want it to change because the performances I've seen from these guys, you know. But um, it was just kind of like, uh, how are they going to react to me? And the if the situation with um, uh, with that one I just told you about when he walked across the room, that was kind of an experience to go, okay. And when I realized you can be yourself, but you have to understand that that other person is that character. So it's kind of fun because you go, well, how would Mike Houston talk to the Joker? Like, how would I be around him? So off camera, in between scenes, most of the time, I just stayed the F out of the way, man. I just was like, like, I'm watching. I am just observing and learning because he's fascinating. He's a he's a beautiful actor. Uh, has always been one of my favorites. And so the opportunity to watch him do his thing was really special. Um, but I've done some other things. You know, I heard this, this story. One of the famous stories is, is um, Daniel Day-Lewis and Lincoln. You know, everyone had to address him as, as Mr. President. Um, um, there's a story that one day an actor came on set to do a rehearsal and he was wearing his tennis shoes and Mr. Lincoln had a conversation with the director and Mr. Spielberg said, can you change your shoes? You know, and, you know, I heard some stuff in the media kind of like, what? that's crazy. Why would you know? And then I'm like, you're missing the point. First of all, let's be honest in that moment. Who's the person that this movie's about Abraham Lincoln. So it's his story. So the idea is if you're a, if you're an artist worth your salt, you want to give the other artist that person, you want to give them the best you can give them so that they can give the best that they can give. And if it if it's better for him, I would have been like, absolutely, out of there, change my shoes, come back in. Now, again, it didn't necessarily mean you have to act differently than yourself, but you did have to respect him. And I understand that now, like address them as the name, address them as their character, let them figure out the world as that character. And you're actually helping them because you're giving them something else to look at to go. I don't even know if I, if I thought about how I'd react to person doing that, you know? Um, so that's, that's one of the, the coolest things is, is to kind of understand the techniques. But again, when you're, when you're hired on a job, especially if you're kind of new to it, love it, love being there, let it sink in, be the kid in a candy store but just be respectful of everyone's process. Because, I mean, geez, when you're on a show like Orange, which is such a huge ensemble, I mean, everybody has different technique. You know, some of us come from the same studio. Some of us come from a different country, you know? You just respect their process. You know, ah, one of the benefits, right? Especially now seeing what, what's going on with Natasha and Poker Face and like um, uh, Red Russian, like, Natasha was awesome to work with because she's one of the most original, unique humans on earth. Her POV is just amazing. I, I just, cause she just, she doesn't believe in small talk, you know? So it's just really kind of telling you what's going on, how it is. And, and, it, and at first it's like, Oh, whoa, whoa. Okay. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm not interfering or anything. And then you realize, no, 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 man. Like you just have to, again, respect the space and respect the process and who this person is. And then, and, and sometimes you'll learn it's better to just listen to some actors, you know, like better just to kind of hang back and, and listen and pay attention because they might be really into something and, and they might be doing some character work and you don't even realize it. And then there are other times where other actors that are, don't necessarily do the method, they'll start having a conversation with you about like, how was your weekend, you know? And then you're like, oh, okay, that door's open now. And I'm gonna give you 
Mike Houston, who will talk to you for about 30 minutes and then we'll get to the point. So that's what people learn about me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it just, it honestly, I, I love folks who engage, right? Like it's, it's yeah. obviously different if you're in the weeds behind the bar and there's five other people you have to serve and you're like, okay, give, dude, give me, give me a second. I'll be, I'll be right back. But when I talk to, you know, people like you, cause I, I have the, the same thing, man. I, it's just, you get so engaging in what you're talking about with the person you're talking to. It yeah. it feels insincere to to sum something up to like five sentences and then a long pause, you know? <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's, no, there's, you're right. That's a good point. <laughs> and that's also the Colorado in us. Like, I'm just glad the East Coast hasn't shaped you into, you know, uh, more of a what the fuck are you looking at kind of guy. <laughs> well, there are those days, man. Like, you know, especially driving that truck through Manhattan now. I'm like, oh, I can get a little salty if I need. One thing I will say, and I had to, there was pointed out to me recently and I had to kind of own up to it is that like, you know, when I moved here, when I moved to Boston and even from Boston here, because man, everyone told me like, oh yeah, no, to no, go to Boston first, it's kind of a warm up city. And then I get to Boston and, and it's a city. It's an awesome city, but Denver's bigger. Denver's bigger than Boston. And I didn't even realize that. So I was like, oh, I'm in the city. I'm in the city. And it's just because I never moved to Denver. You know, like I was always in the Springs. I will say Boston's definitely bigger than Colorado Springs downtown. Um, but then I get to New York and I'm that guy from Colorado, just looking up at all the buildings, strolling. Cause that's what we do in Colorado. We stroll cause we hike and, and let's be honest, you don't want to move fast in Colorado because if you do, you won't be able to take in the magnificence of that place. <laughs> And so I was definitely the stroller for a little bit. And then I got a little hassled. You know, I got hassled on the street a couple of times. Like, hey, man, can you get moving? But now, whenever I go back to the Springs, even when I go back to Denver, dude, if I'm like in line for a coffee and there's like four people ahead of me, I'm chomping at the bit. I'm like, can we just, can we hustle? Like, what's going on? You didn't order ahead? What the heck's going on? Like, you don't have an app? Come on. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and everybody, everybody's like staring at me like, what is this guy's deal? Why does he have all the Broncos gear on, but he's so angry? <laughs> it's like, there's no way this, he must be a transplant. Yeah, this guy's a transplant. He's not from here, man. <laughs> yeah. So, but I, I've actually tried in the last month to work on that. Because I, I was like, I want to get back to Colorado Mike. To Colorado Mike really just takes it in and is just like, can you believe this place? Look how beautiful this is, you know? We're lucky, man. We we grew up with majestic mountains up and down, you know, the range. And and so I think when you're able to see stuff like that on a daily basis and just see the, the gifts that we've been given by whatever created this whole situation, you kind of take it for me, it's everything is that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, it's uh it's being definitely being more uh, more present in that moment and not as much of uh all right, I'm gonna be five minutes late to wherever I'm going and someone's going yeah. to die. Because I'm going to be late. Yeah. It's just going to happen. Boy, it's amazing what you miss, though, and what you miss in those five minutes when you when you carry it that way. It, yeah. it, and again, I, I carried it that I've been carrying it that way for a long time. I've been here almost 20 years now. And so I can definitely, I've definitely got the New Yorker mentality. But I, I when I was in LA, um, it was a good reset to kind of slow it. Because again, LA, LA is different. LA is different than Colorado. LA is different than anywhere. It's got its own thing. But it's definitely more laid back. And it was nice. It was really nice to be around that energy. So when I would go to a restaurant or I would go meet up with a friend or do something, there was no worry about hustle. It's like, ah, get here when you get here, man. No worries, you know. Right. And, and you know, let's hang out. And let's see where we go. Let's see where the night goes. Like, there was no, like, well, we got to do this. We got to plan this. Got to plan this. Even if we had plans it wasn't as rigid as it can get here, you know, like, well, we got to be here by this time because we don't like the subway is going to be late and all this stuff, you know? And um, so I definitely am trying to, <clears throat> I'm trying to bring back Colorado Mike to New York and Mike, we're going to bring these two guys together, have a drink, see what happens. You just got to You got to mesh them. You got to mesh them together. <laughs> it will work. I, I've never done a TikTok. That might be my first TikTok where I do myself in Colorado talking to myself in New York. Please do that and please share that with me because I would love to. Hit show. It's going to be a hit show. I'm, I'm already writing the television show in my head. <laughs> well, I do. Um, 
I, I do want to, as we're wrapping up the, the episode, I want to ask you, man, we've talked about Joker yeah. and she said, and orange is the new black, mm-hmm. but I want to talk about what's, what's coming up next for you. So do you have anything I can give a shout out to or promote with this episode? Yeah. So I just found out today. Um, I was really, again, I use that word lucky a lot. Um, but I really do believe that, um, I've been very fortunate. Um, but, um, uh, was it last year we shot this thing? Yeah, I think last April, a year ago. Um, I was given an opportunity to be in this independent film. Um, and it's it's a horror movie, but it's kind of a psychological horror. Um, a really interesting, um, a really interesting script and fascinating director uh, named uh, Patrick Clement. Um, but he writes under the name Seabold Krebs. And uh, the actors I worked with, uh, it was Charlotte Pope and Devin Gillis, I think is his last name. I, I can't think of it right now. He, I, don't, it, I don't want him to kill me if I, but these are two amazing actors, right? And I got to play this kind of supporting character in this film. Just found out today that there's this um, festival that has a relationship with Cannes. And they selected 14 films to go to Cannes during their during the Cannes Film Festival. But what's kind of cool is that seven of the films are finished and are looking for buyers. Seven of seven other films are in post production and looking to see if anybody's interested in, in helping um, kind of take it to the next and then buy it and, and, and distribute. And the film is called Bury Me When I'm Dead. And uh, yeah, Patty and uh, 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 Nick, the, the producer, they got, they got selected. And uh, it was announced today. It's just, it's just an awesome thing, man, because, you know, and I believe it's, it's the only American film that was chosen uh, from the post-production group. Um, but the reason I'm talking about it like this is because I think Patrick is going to be someone that we're going to be seeing a lot of. He is a phenomenal director. He is a phenomenal human being. Uh, he is, he is, he's just a very unique, lovely human being and an amazing director. Um, so I'm really excited for him kind of to see where this, this takes it. You know, he just, uh, he went to Columbia for grad school, um, got his master's in film from there. And I think like just out of the pandemic, like that's what he did. And now he's got this, feature he had one feature that he shot he's from kansas and he shot a feature there um that did a festival run and got a lot of love and then this one is his second feature and it's in this process so really excited about that bury me when i'm dead and fortunately i got i got some work coming up uh i will be um leaving in may to go work on um this project that kevin costner is doing uh it's a pretty epic project. It's called Horizon. Dude, you booked Horizon? I did, yeah. I got so he's got four films, right? I'm I'm gonna be in the second film. Yeah. We all of us here have been auditioning for that nonstop for the last like oh yeah, month. I can imagine. <laughs> There's 185 <laughs> characters in that thing, you know, across all four movies. So oh, oh buddy, thanks, that's man. So yeah. Cool. Oh, you have yeah. I I mean, I'm gonna be in a western. I get to check that off my bucket list that I am going to be an actor in a Kevin Costner Western movie directed by Kevin Costner. Yeah. Super excited, man. Oh my um, God, dude. I don't, I didn't have to sign an NDA on that one, but I don't, I don't, I don't think I can go too much into detail about it, uh, about my character, but I, I will just say that um, it's a fun, it's a fun character, fun color. Uh, you know, I'm excited. I, I'm just, I'm just pumped. We get to go to Utah, Yeah. Utah in May, you know, around zion national park like it's just going to be incredible it's going to be like home oh yeah yeah you're a hop skipping and jumping yeah. away <laughs> yeah yeah if i wanted to just jump in a car for about five hours i can go to the four corners and step in colorado for a little bit yeah <laughs> that's so <laughs> awesome man no i'm so happy yeah. for you i i have not Thanks, met a single man. person who at least who i know who has booked that we've all just been auditioning oh. and then just <laughs> waiting like Someone's got to, we're all here. Like someone's got to get it. You're from Colorado. So I'm counting it. I'm counting it as a win. Oh, right on, man. I'll take it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Fascinating. I mean, I just, 
when I learned about what this was, like what the entire project is, I just thought this is this is amazing. And also, I'm looking forward to watching his work ethic mm-hmm. and how he because I thought, how in the world are you going to do four of these? They're they're all clocking in just under three hours. And so and he just wrapped the first one, I guess. And I just thought, wow, this guy is what a workaholic. What and then I mean that in the in the most generous way. Like to have that passion about something and want it because you know that's he's clearly fascinated and just steeped in this in this idea of how the West came to be. And so I'm really, really, really excited to see one, how the whole project comes together and what it, what it looks like, but also just kind of to watch this process. Because like I said, I, I like directing as well. And the only thing I've ever really directed are small 10 minute plays, you know? And this is gonna be a really cool, like mentor experience for me. He's not gonna know he's my mentor, but I'm definitely gonna be sitting around when I'm not on camera, paying attention, like, you know, talking to his ZP and talking to, you know, all the people, just kind of get a sense of really how this goes, how it works. So I'm excited. Oh, yeah, I, I'm I'm so pumped for you. Well, I thanks, man. Man, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up the recording here with one more thing. But cool. this has been just a blast chatting with you. It's just funny, like we were talking before, the idea of somebody saying, "Hey, I know this person. You want to talk to this person? Yeah, I do want to talk to this person." And it's just like an instant. Yeah, well, we're buddies now, so I'm forcing that on you. Oh, dude, are you kidding um, me? Like, if I'm in LA, we're hanging. You're in LA, right? <laughs> no, I'm in Colorado still. Oh, you're in Colorado. <laughs> oh man, I misunderstood. I thought we were saying the time zone. Oh, where in Colorado? I'm just north of Denver. I will. Okay, well, when I, I guess I can say it. I'm in Thornton. Yeah, you can say Thornton. Yeah, no one's. I, I it's like I like someone's gonna like track me down. Like, yeah, no, yeah. No, I'm dude, in I know Thornton. I I used to live in Louisville. Like, uh, oh like, yeah, right man. In, like, yeah, man. When I because I went to school in Boulder. Um, yeah. yeah, no. Listen, when I come when I come home when I come because uh, when I was in college I went to see you Boulder. Um, I looked up uh, the Nacapella group and. You know, we're still best buddies. And so uh, I try to come out there whenever I can. Uh, I definitely want to try to get out there this summer, you know, because um, Jenny, Jenny's only been out there a couple of times and she's never been out there during the summer. And I was like, I, I want to take you out there. I want to go up to the, the ski mountains to show you what they look like when there's not skiing. It's yeah. just beautiful hiking and just, you know, magnificent views and, and all that stuff but definitely when i come out we're gonna hang it heck yeah man and hey yeah, uh yeah. my friend has a film going to tribeca so if that goes through it i'm in oh Utah, yeah I'm hit you up for sure please man also <laughs> would you do me a favor send me the details because i'd love to go support oh yeah absolutely i'm i've been right texting her, I'm like hey let me know when the details are okay i will no i'm i'm dead serious let me know <laughs> um awesome. Awesome. well man dude the the last thing we have for this episode it's my favorite thing. It's what we call an awkward goodbye. So uh, I, I assume you've seen Wayne's World, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So this is reminiscent of the scene where Wayne walks off the set and Garth is left by himself and he kind of like freaks out. So uh, I'm going to give you a silent three, two, one cameraman countdown. When I point to the camera, just give us your best verbal awkward goodbye. And then I'll stop the recording from there. Okay. Is that good? All right. Here we go. In. Oh, bye. Bye.